She had the largest crowds of anybody of her day. Thousands would come asking her to pray for them to be healed. When she moved to LA to build her church, a tithe of the population of Los Angeles was a member of her church. She'd be kidnapped twice, married three times. She's the first lady of Pentecost, Amy Simmel McPherson. I'm Robert Slairton, and this is God's Generals. I've always enjoyed studying the life of Amy Symbol McPherson. She stands out above all the other Pentecostals because of her personality, because of her entrepreneurship, because she was the first in so many. She was the first Christian radio station in American history, the third one in Los Angeles. Her life began in Canada. Her mother was a Salvation Army preacher. Her father was 50 years old. Her mother was 15 when she was born. So I would guess she was born in the controversy of her parents being such age differences when they got married and had their first child. Throughout her life, her mother would be her standby and her support through ups and downs and even in their own struggle and their own fight with each other trying to run their great ministry. Amy McPherson, in the beginning of her life, did not really know if God was real didn't know if God was alive because when she went to school, they told her one thing. When she went to church, they told her something else and she didn't know what to believe. But one night as a young girl, she asked God, if you're out there, wherever you are, reveal yourself to me. And God did. And she found salvation. In a little while, she met her husband named Robert Simple. Robert Simple was a Salvation Army preacher who had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues. So he had the fire of the Salvation Army for souls and the fire of the Holy Ghost for all the other aspects of Christian ministry. What a great combination. They got married and Robert Simple was Amy's Bible school. He would teach her the word. They would read the Bible together and underline the different scriptures with different colored pencils. He would teach her what this verse meant and what that chapter is about. And that's how she learned the Bible. That's how she began her ministerial training. Then they felt called as a couple to go to Macau. So they began to tell all their friends in the revival meetings that they were going to be a missionary, pray for them, support them. She goes over to the United Kingdom. She preaches her first public sermon in Ireland. And she is recorded of saying, it's like praying in tongues when it comes out English. She was so thrilled the first time she preached. Then they finally got to Macau. And while they were there, there were so many cultural differences. There were so many things that were not prepared for. And eventually the saddest thing happened while they were there. Her husband, Robert Simple, died. He died because Amy did not know how to take care and prepare the food right. So in not preparing the food right, he got malaria and he died. She was pregnant with their first child, which would be a daughter named Roberta. Her mother in Canada would have to raise the money to buy them the boat tickets to come back from China to the Canadian uh, homeland. And then when she got home, she decided, well, since I'm not married, I have a little child, I'll just become a nice little woman, have a mother, and stay here with my mom on the farm in Canada. But she got sick. And on her deathbed, she said, I cried out to God for healing. And she repented and said, I'll preach if you want me to preach. Because remember, in those days, women didn't preach. It was a man's job. So to be a woman preacher was meant you're breaking through a lot of cultural barriers. But she got up after being healed by praying that prayer and accepting her call. God zapped her, healed her, she got up and began to preach. Now in the beginning days, her crowds weren't very big. So what she would do, she'd go into town and she would do different stunts. Like one time I was told she went to a town and found the center part of the city where most of the traffic would be going at lunchtime. And she stood on the street corner and began to look up at the sky like she was looking at something and folks would walk by and look up and pretty soon a crowd would gather. When the crowd got big enough, though she thought could fill up the auditorium that she had rented or the tent she'd set up, she'd run down the street saying, follow me, I'll tell you what I'm looking for. And then she'd jump on the platform, grab her tambourine and start singing she was looking for the king. And then she'd start preaching. This is a part of Amy's personality that made people love her and some think she was absolutely crazy. But at the end, we all love her. So eventually her meetings begin to grow and then she decided, well, now that she's got a little child and that home feeling began to grab her, she decided to get married again. And she married a man named Harold McPherson and she had a second child named Rolf. So she has two children, she has a family, and Mr. McPherson wanted a nice little home, nice little wife, little children, come home from work with the meal and the white picket fence. But I must ask, 
If you ever saw Amy, couldn't you compute that this woman that you're looking at is not going to be your nice little American wife? She is bigger than that. Her dreams are bigger. Her personality is bigger. Long story short, that marriage ended. When it ended, instead of being sad and feeling like her life was over and she messed up, she put her babies in her big car and she began to drive across America to preach the gospel. She didn't let heartache stop her. She kept going forward. She was the first woman to drive in a car from one side of America to the other side. That was her first big event in her life. A first woman in America to drive a car across the country. And this is the beginning of many firsts for her. So as we go through this story today, you don't want to miss it. The life of Amy McPherson will astound you. I took my suitcase and my baby and I started off in the night, got a taxi cab, went to the depot and started out to preach the word of God. I was invited to this town, that town, to preach the word of God. Preached outdoors under the trees, preached on the piazza, preached on the street corner. Well, you can see one of our street meetings as we preached the word of God. I preached from Canada, clear to Key West, Florida, by winter and by summer, in tents or in open air or in buildings as the Lord opened up the ways and the word of God began to go forth. Crowds came, and the multitudes gave their hearts to Jesus Christ, and the sick were healed. And oh, I was happy. Bless the Lord. Amy McPherson took her gospel car and her babies and began to drive across the country preaching in big towns and small towns and out in the fields. She'd stop when she'd see the cotton pickers in the south. She'd stop her car and run out there and talk to them about Jesus and give them a gospel track and pray for them. In those days, the gospel evangelistic field was open to anybody who would go after it, kind of like it is today. If you've got the desire, if you've got the passion, you can create anything you want to create in this world that we live in today. So Amy McPherson took her car and her babies and began to preach. I asked her son one time in all those early days of ministry on the, in the gospel car and those tent meetings and those small convention centers, what was the greatest miracle you saw? I thought he would say it would be like a blind eye opening or a crippled child being healed, but he told me a story that I want to tell you because it illustrates her faith and her wildness of believing God for the unusual and would get it. He said, we were driving across in the gospel car and we had a flat tire and we had no spare. And in those days, they didn't have cell phones and the homes were far apart and they were dirt roads and the night was coming on very soon and she got concerned because she was a mama with two kids in the middle of nowhere. So she jumped out, walked around the car a couple of times, Rolf said, then, he, then she told us, Get out of the car. We're going to pray for the tire. So my mother, my sister and I, he said, laid hands on the tire and asked God to heal the tire. And I felt the tire under my hands reinflate and become normal. We got back in the car and drove across the country and finished our trip that day and that night. So to me, thank God for the healings of the bodies, but I guess God can fix tires too when you need them to get fixed. This is Amy McPherson's type of faith. It is not your traditional. She don't fit in this box where everybody wants you to fit. If you're a preacher, you fit like this, you talk like this, you act like this, and you believe like this. Hopefully you'll be outside the box too because that's what our world needs today is somebody outside of the religious box that we're in now to create a, a signpost in the middle of the nation for Jesus Christ. She went to Los Angeles and she had a meeting of about 3,500 people. And at this time, her children were getting a little bit older and it was time for them to start school and the heart of a mother was kicking in. She wanted a place where her children could go to school and come home and she wanted a place where she didn't have to always be in tents or be driving or going through some of the hardships of the traveling uh, evangelists that she was for most of their little, their little life. And the Lord told her that Los Angeles was gonna be her home base. While she was out there in Los Angeles, she began to pray one night in an all-night prayer meeting. And when God spoke that word to her, she began to do what we call in Pentecost, a shouting spell. They said she shouted so much that her bobby pins fell out of her hair and her hair went every place because God spoke that he had given her the city of Los Angeles. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's kind of an egotistical thing. Well, it's not egotistical if God told it to you. She began to preach in that city. And a long story short, she built her church of over 5,000 people. She had a tithe of the Los Angeles population at that time of 25,000 people as the member of Angeles Temple. That was the name of her church. So she built that church. She got those members in there. And when she opened it, she began preaching 21 times a week, just herself. Well, you can only do that so long before you're physically and emotionally exhausted. But in the beginning, Amy did all of the services. 
She preached morning, noon, and night. They came in from everywhere. And as the church began to grow and other pastors began to come to help her, she became famous for her Sunday evening service called her Illustrated Sermons. Hollywood would come over to see what she was doing in her Illustrated Sermons to put them back in the new industry called movies. The golden era of movies had begun to take place in, in Los Angeles. She became good friends with one of the great movie stars at the time called Charlie Chaplin. And Charlie Chaplin would help her do certain things in, the, in, her, in her illustrated sermons and she would help him do certain things in his movie. So they had this secret friendship because in those days, Hollywood and the church were enemies. They didn't think each other liked each other and they didn't in those days. They fought. So Amy and Charlie would rent a restaurant late at night and bring their families together so they could talk and keep this friendship. They had to keep it a secret because if Hollywood knew that Charlie was the famous preacher and and if, if the church world did that Amy with Charlie Chaplin, there'd be a problem. But you know, God does not always obey these kind of traditions. Uh, the Holy Spirit goes places that tradition won't let you. And you must decide if you want to follow tradition or the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that Amy followed the Holy Spirit and did what she did in her day. She was the first Christian radio station in America. She saw the advent of radio as reaching people who could not come to church or who would accidentally turn her on. And so she was the third Christian, the third station in Los Angeles, the first one in America. And there's a big uh, show that they put on years later because when she turned on her radio station in California, the other two stations began to have problems because her signal was so powerful and they kept writing in Washington, D.C. about turn her down, give her less wattage. And finally, at the end of the trial and the end of the fuss, Amy's statement one, you can't make God's voice be second. He's always going to be first. And her radio station stayed strong and is still going today in Los Angeles. Sister McPherson had lots of things that she did right. There was controversies too. Mamie McPherson, when you're that famous, you know, you cannot have people go, I love you, I love you, there's gonna be something that I hate you. William Randolph Hearst, the founder of many of the newspapers around the country and the founder of Yellow Journalism, told his newspaper men, kill Amy, which meant always find things to come against her or mis, uh, misrepresent her and make her look like a fool. So when you go through the LA Times, you'll be able to see her name in the LA paper so much, and most of it was negative. And she asked the papers, newspaper reporters one time, why do you write so many mean things that aren't true about me? He goes, well, they sell papers and our boss wants us to always find things to make fun of you. So she had to learn how to live with a negative press. When I come back in a few minutes, we're gonna talk about her kidnapping, the most famous part of her controversy in her life. Sister McPherson is a class act. Before we go to the break, I wanna introduce you one little clip. I found some clips of her uh, speaking in the newsreels back in those time periods before they used to play on the movies. So here's one of Amy McPherson on her way to Broadway. Come to Broadway, the Mecca of sin, the citadel of worldliness. Oh, I feel in answering this invitation as though I should like to stand in the midst of the broadways of America and lift up my hands and cry, stop. You're drifting away from the faith of your fathers. You're drifting away from prayer, drifting away from the Bible reading, drifting away from the family altar and only ruin and a heartbreak and a home break lay in the direction of backsliding. I am coming out to help bring you back if I can to the fold. Give me a burden for souls, Lord. Give me a love for the lost. Let my heart bleed as I own, Lord. Give me a burden for souls. Leaving Los Angeles for New York and the boat upon which we sail immediately, I was met en route by multitudes of our friends. Among them ever was a liberal sprinkling of newspaper men. And in each city, they asked the same question. Sister McPherson, what do you think of prohibition? It was rather difficult to answer the question in such a few words as one must use them. But I told them that the case of our prohibition here in the United States reminds me of the story of the lecturer who gave a marvelous address on prohibition. And he wound up in a blaze of glory that brought everyone to their feet enthusiastically. Why, he said, my friends, if I had my way, do you know what I'd do? I'd take every barrel of liquor, every bottle of booze, every crate, and I'd empty it in the river. Yes, sir. Then he said, shall we now close our meeting by rising and singing together, shall we gather at the river? 
He'd spoiled it all. And that's the way, perhaps, with us over here in America. We teach it, but so often those who profess to make the laws do not quite live up to them and back them themselves. I wish that you could all have the joy of going with us this Easter tide to the Holy Land, where we shall visit on Easter Day the tomb of our risen Lord. My trip has convinced me that all the world is looking to America for guidance. The sudden dramatic fall of the Blue Eagle proves the impossibility of flying on one wing, namely material recovery. What America needs is to don the other wing and rise in spiritual recovery. It is to be hoped that out of all this suffering may come a deeper understanding and a return to old-fashioned Christian American principles. What you've heard on today's show is only a small fraction of the incredible stories of another one of God's generals. For the complete story, pick up a copy of God's Generals, Volume 1, today. This historical classic contains the compelling spiritual biographies of 12 extraordinary heroes of faith, men and women who were dynamically empowered by the Holy Spirit to ignite the fires of revival worldwide. You will discover how they achieved their amazing successes and how you can become a victorious leader for God. In this volume, you will be captivated by the lives of John Alexander Dowie, Maria Woodworth Eder, Evan Roberts, Charles F. Parham and William J. Seymour, John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Semple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, William Branham, Jack Coe, and A. A. Allen. Order a copy today or other life-changing books by visiting robertslearden.com. That's robertslearden.com. Or by calling 1-877-888-1500 for U.S. residents or 1-941-748-3883 for viewers outside the U.S. Robert Slearden accurately depicts without bias the good, bad, and the ugly so you can learn from the lives of God's generals. Order your copy today. I want to tell you a few more stories about Sister McPherson. Before I do, I want to highly suggest and encourage you to call the number on your screen or go to my website and order the book where I talk about her life because I can't tell you everything about her in 30 minutes. So order the God's Generals book and the other books that go with it. You'll enjoy it. You'll love to see what God did through a woman who kept saying yes when the world kept saying no. Behind me here on this set, we have a stretcher here. I hope you can see it really good in the, in the picture here. And it reminds me of a story that she'd have to have stretcher day in her crusades. There were people who could not come and wait in the prayer lines in the normal services in the morning and at night. So in all of her crusades, she'd have stretcher day. I'm showing you a picture right now of Amy in Denver, Colorado. And you look at the picture, she's there in the white dress, looking out over the bottom of the auditorium of all the people in the stretchers there. And she'd take the whole afternoon, there'd be no preaching, just singing, and she'd be out there praying for them one by one. And her philosophy was this, she would not take her hands off of you until she felt the anointing of God leave her hands. Once it came out of her hands, then her job was done as between you and God. Her success rate was phenomenal in getting people healed. At Angela's Temple, though, there was another thing that she would do. Because there was folks who could not come and sit in the service because of their physical challenges and their illnesses, she'd have Ambulance Day in Los Angeles. And it's a fact in LA that when Amy would announce on the radio that this month on this Saturday or this Thursday is Ambulance Day, the sick people would start booking up all the ambulances in LA, in LA County and the surrounding cities, and the hospitals would have to reserve certain ones for true emergencies because everybody would book up all the ambulances and head for Angeles Temple. And they would line up around the front of the church, down the blocks around, and those days her home was right next to Angeles Temple and there was a little road. And they'd bring the ambulances down to her back door and she would stand on the back doorstep and get in and out of the ambulances and praying for the sick that way. I love these kind of stories about Sister McPherson. I wish I had a three or four hours just to take her life and walk slowly through what she did, how she did it, how she overcame. They asked her one time, why are you a success? Why does your church live? Why does your meetings have so many miracles and people coming to them from everywhere? She goes, it's because I preach the great I am, not the great I was. And this is one of Amy's, I think, simplistic, simple answers of success. She believed that I am was still the I am of today. She did not preach that I was. He didn't do things. He still does it today. And then came word from God to launch out into the deep. I began preaching in the big theaters, in the big auditorium, such as the auditorium in St. Louis. I think many of you are familiar with it seating some 18,000 people. God filled that from early morning until late at night. Such buildings as the Denver Municipal Auditorium, where the firemen would have to stay in at night after my meeting was over and hunt away up in the attic, up where the electric wires are, and drag the men down out of there 
and get the women from out of the restrooms downstairs who had barricaded themselves in the basement to be there for the next day's meeting for fear they couldn't get in. God brought people to the altar. There's a thousand people converted at one service. We would have to have the men first and then the women or vice versa. Friends, I'll tell you, it's a, ooh, it's a thriller to be a, a preacher. Why don't every one of you folks get converted and give your heart to God? Sister McPherson, as she was at the height of her career, had one of the most controversial things happen to her. This was a kidnapping. Now, she'd been kidnapped twice in her life. Early in her ministry, a newspaper reporter was interviewing her, and the Ku Klux Klan had taken her and the reporter out for a private meeting. When she got done preaching to the Ku Klux Klan, instead of burning the cross, they were burning their hoods and getting saved. So, but the second time was more dramatic. Now she was famous all over the world. She's gone to Europe, gone to Asia. She is at the height of her ministry. The L.A. church is at the pinnacle of its prestige and popularity. And in the middle of this, she's kidnapped. And here's what happened. She had just come back from Israel, and she was going to tell the church family what she saw in the Holy Land. She would only have one service to do that. There were so many people trying to get into the auditorium or her church. She was going to have to have five of those services just to tell people what she saw while she was there. And they were doing some construction on the church where she couldn't get her notes together with her secretary. So they decided to go down to the beach, finish her outline of what she was going to tell that night, and take a swim in the ocean. Now that right there is also a big deal too in Amy's life. Amy was the first Pentecostal to cut her hair, to wear makeup, and to look fabulous, if you can use that word, because in those days, the Pentecostals had this lingering holiness mindset, which had come into the flesh where it's how you look. They couldn't cut the hair. They looked real ugly, but Amy looked beautiful. And they asked her one time, why do you wear makeup? And she goes, well, any old barn needs some paint, and I'm going to put some paint on to look my best for Jesus. And that's what she did. So all the ladies in Pentecost around the world Oh, Sister McPherson, a big thank you for breaking that religious, stupid tradition that you can't wear makeup and be a preacher or go to church. So she's out at the beach, and her secretary went to get her some orange juice to drink, and she was going to go swim in the ocean. And a man walked up to her and said, are you Sister McPherson? She goes, yes. She goes, he goes, the temple sent me down here to ask you to come and pray for our child that is sick. My wife is in the car up there, and he pointed at the car, uh, holding the child, and would you just pray for her, because our child is going to die unless God heals the child. So Amy, being as kind as she was, said sure. She grabbed the towel and put it around herself and walked up to the car talking to the man. And when she bent over to greet the woman, the man pushed her in, and the lady in the car put chloroform over her nose and knocked her out, and they drove her off. Eventually, they took her to old Mexico. Well, the secretary comes back and thinks Amy is still swimming, but then time passes, and so concern sets in, and all of a sudden, she calls the church, thinking maybe somebody picked her up, and, and then pretty soon, they realize that Amy is gone, and, and a few more hours go by, Amy is dead. She drowned in the ocean. So the noise went everywhere. Amy McPherson has drowned. The body's not been found. It's lost at sea. So after a little few days goes by and they can't find the body, they go ahead and have the funeral. The funeral, her mother preaches it, her mother takes the helm of the church, and everybody's crying. But Amy is in old Mexico, and the kidnappers keep sending kidnapping notes, and they keep throwing the kidnapping notes in the trash, and you go, why? Well, when you're that popular, sometimes people don't realize of all the weird things that happen to you from strange people. Most of the people are good people, but there's a small percent of folks who are always trying to do something to you that you kind of build a callousness around them because they're just essentially weird, or they're sent by the devil to irritate you. So her mother kept throwing the kidnapping notes in the trash can. But she escapes, Amy does, from old Mexico, walks across into Douglas, Arizona. While in Douglas, Arizona, she knocks on the first door and the guy didn't answer the door and told her to go away. Goes to the next house, knocks on the door and collapse. So the ambulance comes, takes her to the hospital. Chief of police comes. And long story short, when they revive her, they ask, who are you? She says, I'm Amy McPherson. And he goes, no, she's dead. She goes, no, I am Amy McPherson. So he calls the church in L.A., long story short, she tells a secret to her mother that only the family knows, and the news is announced that Amy is alive. When she comes back to L.A., over 50,000 people meet her at the train station to welcome Amy home. And then all of a sudden, the attorney general decides that she did this for money or publicity and all these things, so a trial or a hearing starts. And they accuse her of having an affair. They accuse her of running off and doing this, all kinds of things. With a long story short, she wins. And every night, 
after the trial, she'd get up and tell on the radio uh, what her side of the story was. And the interesting fact about the church, the church didn't dwindle during this. It stayed strong in numbers, strong in money, strong in support. Would you stay a member of the church if your pastor was on trial for a kidnapping with all the news in the newspaper being negative about him or her? I don't know if today's generation has that kind of stamina, but I hope we'll get back to that. Sister McPherson has so many more things. She sold more war bonds than all the movie stars put together during the time of World War II. She'd also win the awards in the Rose Bowl parades for having the best float in the Rose Bowl parade. She had her own parades in Los Angeles. She'd travel around the country. She began to build a denomination because out of her Bible school began to come her students and they build churches. She wanted to put all those churches among the Assemblies of God denomination, but because she was divorced, they wouldn't accept her, so she had to build the Foursquare denomination. Now, let me make one comment here. It doesn't matter what you go through. It's a matter if you keep on going. So much of the time, we people, we have mistakes in our life. We make mistakes. We sin. We do things that we later think we shouldn't have done. But no matter what you do, get up and go on. The righteous may fall, but they come back. And Amy kept bouncing back over a kidnapping, over her third marriage is about to happen and a divorce is going to occur. Haven't I got a beautiful bride? I'm very, very happy. I feel that I'm the most happy person in all the world. Every one of our members and friends have been so beautiful and sending in thousands of letters and telegrams and phone calls. I think this is the beginning of a very happy life together. My trip was primarily one for health and recuperation following my nervous breakdown of some three years ago. I am very grateful for this beautiful rest. I'm so happy to be back in America, back to our church and to the evangelistic work. When trouble or shadows cross our sky, it's a marvelous thing to be able to turn to the rock of ages and the Lord's own work. Well, what are your plans with reference to your husband? Pardon? I would have been so happy to have had him continue in the Lord's work, but his life, of course, is in the hands of the Lord, and that's something I'll be unable to decide for him. I have formed no plans. All this news which has come to me has come very suddenly and without warning. I feel I must wait till I get home and know the details. So Amy went through all the negatives. And what's the story for us? God is a God of a second chance, a third chance, and a fourth chance. And God doesn't obey public opinion. If you stay connected with God, you can win. I hope you will enjoy the last clip I have of Sister McPherson. She's a class act. She's one of a kind. I wish I had a chance to see her uh, as a child, but I did not. Uh, my grandmother tried to see her and wanted to go to her Bible school, but she couldn't make it from North Carolina to L.A. But I'm glad we have this film clip so you can at least get to hear her personality. She dies in Oakland, California of an accidental overdose of her medication. They found her not breathing well, and she died early that morning, and even her death was a controversy. Her denomination continued to grow after her death because her son, Rolf, knew his place. He goes, I'm not a preacher. I'm an administrator. Let me administrate, and you do the preaching. And with those that were left behind, they knew how to work together and continue the ministry that God gave the Foursquare Gospel. I am overjoyed, nearly overwhelmed, by the glorious tribute paid by the people of Los Angeles, Southern California, and the churches of the Foursquare Gospel. I pray that I may live many years to serve God and my country. I thank you, and God bless you. Amen.